This live presentation was produced in Ashland, Oregon by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. RVML relies on the support of our volunteers, members, and donors to organize and present these programs. For more information about this presentation or to borrow, download, or purchase other recordings from our catalog, please visit our website at rvml.org. for coming. Does the sound sound all right? Is that loud enough? It's, is it? Okay. All right. So I don't have to talk too loud. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful to you for being here because uh, having an opportunity to speak about this work is absolutely a dream come true for me. I've been uh, studying the nature of reality and consciousness and uh, what the heck is going on here is kind of my word for it uh, for about 15 years now. I had a spiritual awakening back when I was uh, teaching skiing and dancing in Whistler, BC. And uh, on hindsight, I figure I raised my baseline level of joy so high that I started going into altered states of consciousness and I started having mystical experiences. And uh, that really blew my mind and I started on a path of trying to understand what was happening. And I uh, got to realize fairly quickly that I was not the first person to have expanded awareness. And about a year into that process, I met Nassim. And uh, it, was, it was one of those fortuitous meetings because I was always talking about this kind of thing. And I had a friend in Whistler who was also uh, a friend in Nassim's. And he, go, and he met me one day and he said, you know, I have this friend who talks about this kind of stuff all the time too. You guys ought to meet. So it was one of those, uh, you know, meetings in a coffee shop and, you know, drawing on a paper napkin. And I was trying to draw a, a donut shape that I had been dreaming about. And as I'm, you know, it's what it's like to draw a donut with a, with a ballpoint pen and a napkin. It's a little bit challenging. But as I was doing it, he said, you know, you're describing my work. And I said, well, what's your work? And, he's, and he said, well... You start with a circle and you put the triangle in the middle and you know and, and on and on and on and describing how you can have infinity in a finite space and and all this kind of thing well anyhow we became fast friends at that point and I was helping him for quite a while with his research I helped him start write his book he uh, took me to get my first van I lived in a van in Whistler for four and a half years I think he broke my record he was about six years in, in his van and uh, and it was um, a major part of my process. I, he went on to, um, to study more, and he kind of went underground a little bit because he wanted to get this work published um, more than anything. He didn't want to uh, be too uh, public with it until he had a chance to publish. So he, he was sort of laying low for a while. And in the meantime, I was continuing to study consciousness and, and reality and sacred geometry and, and all kinds of different things on my own. And uh, in that 15-year period, I never, ever found anything more compelling than this theory and this information. Now, how many people here have seen the DVD or the video or are familiar with Nassim's work already? Is there anybody that this is, that this is new information? Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that because uh, my personal specialty is to present the, uh, it's fairly complicated in some ways, but my specialty is to present it in a way that's simple and easy to conceptualize, easy to get. You don't have to be a physicist to understand this. And uh, if you're like the rest of us, you'll find it really rings true on a lot of levels. Um, my friend Derek here is also somebody who, uh, when he got introduced to Nassim's work, had that same kind of resonance, realizing that there is really something to this. And uh, Derek and I both just came back from Hawaii uh, where we were studying um, as a part of the emissary program. Nassim is very, very busy, and he, again, as I say, his, his drive to get this information out there is very, very strong for him. And he was finding he just hasn't had enough time to present himself, so he taught 12 of us emissaries to teach his, his work. He's given us all his presentation slides and, and all the media that he has, and uh, we're in constant contact learning what's new and and what's going on at the Resonance Project. So, uh, so it's uh, been quite a journey. I tell you what, sitting in that room, we spent 10 days in, uh, on the Big Island of Hawaii in a conference room with Nassim. Now, you have to imagine, there's palm trees outside. It's gorgeous. There's the beach and the dolphins and everything else. We're in a conference room with the curtains shut so that we could see the videos. 
and there was not one spot we would rather be than in that room listening to Nassim. I mean, I think we all felt like just about as lucky as we could possibly be. And um, I stayed on the Big Island for an extra three months and uh, had an opportunity to stay on the, on the project land and, uh, you know, spent a lot of time thinking and meditating and pondering. And any time I came up with some, uh, some epiphanies, I was able to just go to Nassim and say, okay, so the vacuum density fluctuation is the cause of the spin. Then what's the cause of the vacuum density fluctuation? And, you know, just able to get into conversations like that every day. Well, not every day, but uh, quite a few conversations. And I, I feel like I'm just about the most fortunate person on this planet. So to be able to teach this work, I feel like I've died and gone to heaven. I'm just as, as pleased as punch to be able to do that. Now, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit more about Nassim. He's, um, he's uh, born in Geneva. His mother is Italian, his father is Iranian, he was raised in Montreal, Canada, he now lives in Hawaii. His first language is French and he's dyslexic. He can kind of read and write, he's, you know, he, he struggles along, but he's one of these, you know, genius types who's so smart and so focused and so aware that even the fact that he's, you know, having trouble reading and writing in English as a second language. He has done more studying and has more awareness. He has the equivalent of, of um, PhD, but he doesn't ha have anything more than a, uh, he dropped out of high school at age 16, which uh, apparently uh, Einstein had the same problem in high school, so he's in good company. And um, the, 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 what we're gonna talk about here is um, essentially a unified field theory. Unified field theory has been the goal of science kind of since science began. An, a, a way to find an equation that unifies the cosmological size events in this universe as well as the itty bitty quantum size events in the universe. And so far there's, there's been a few theories but they're all not quite hitting the mark in my opinion and uh, none of them have been universally accepted. Uh, I'm quite convinced that when this is understood in, uh, in a um, in the mainstream that it's going to fit the bill. It, it has an amazing uh, ability to predict and explain phenomena on all levels of scale. And in fact, that's a lot of what this is about. It's about scale. Has anyone seen Horton Hears a Who or read the, read the book lately? It's all about scales. It's all about fractals. And for us to discount something just because it's way too big or way too small, for us to be able to appropriately understand is not a reason to say it doesn't exist or it's, it's not important. So this is a big part of uh, Nassim's theory. The other, uh, the other way that this theory unifies is not just big and small, but past and future. And that's when it gets really exciting. That's when you start getting shivers. Because when we look to the past on this planet, we see that there are references and examples of this exact geometry in the pyramids, in ancient texts, ancient monuments, all kinds of different references to it throughout the planet and even off planet if you start looking at the moon and Mars and you know beyond and beyond. It, this knowledge has been on this planet before, I, I believe. Um, and then it unifies the future. We see this, this geometry represented in crop circles. And I believe Again, I got to tell you, this, this is all just theory, this is all just my opinion, what I'm going to tell you. I offer it to you to, to make your own judgments. It's been well researched, but uh, you know, you have, to, you have to come to your own conclusions. Um, I believe those crop circles represent part of where we're going. I think that we are destined to become galactic citizens. And uh, there's already contact beginning, and, uh, and they're talking about geometry. So. I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited to be able to present to you the geometry of this theory and, uh, and then we're going to show you some examples of where we see it represented and, uh, and it's quite an extraordinary journey. So when Nassim started on this lifelong work, he was, uh, when he was a little kid, he was one of those precocious, probably annoying, that's my opinion. I asked his sister a few weeks ago what, uh, what it was like to have Nassim as a, as a brother, and she looked at me and she said, hell. <laughs> really smart kid, 
bit of a uh, bit of personality, I think. You know, he was uh, quite a quite a quite a kid, and um, he had imaginary friends, and he had been seeing other dimensions, and of course, nobody believed him, nobody supported him, nobody understood the idea of indigo children or any of that kind of thing, and they just gave him a hard time, and he was quite misunderstood. So when he got into his first geometry lesson and they were going to talk about dimensions, he got really excited and he tells the story of sitting in this class thinking, okay, we're finally going to find out what, what these dimensions are all about. Do you guys remember the, your first geometry lesson when they talked about dimensions? And they start with uh, the dot. And they, I remember my first lesson, I was in sixth grade and, and they put the, the dot on the board and they say, okay, well, what's this? And you know, we said, oh, it's a dot. And, and uh, it's the, you know, all, all the kids are giving examples. And then the teacher said, it doesn't exist. It's dimension zero. It doesn't have volume. It doesn't exist. And that's a little, uh, a little funny because we just finished giving this big long list of, of what it could be. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, thing they do is they put a bunch of dots together and, and uh, call it a line and say, this is dimension one. It also doesn't exist because it doesn't have volume, and it's, uh, yeah, dimension one. Next one, of course, is taking one, two, three, four. <laughs> There's, when I get nervous, I seem to have the an lose the ability to count, so I apologize for that. When you put four of those lines together, you get a plane. Do you, do you guys remember this class? Does anyone remember this class? It's, it's weird kind of logic. You get into uh, the second dimension, and this is, of course, where comic book strips live in a, you know, sort of flat land. And they take six of those uh, non-existing flat planes and put them together in the shape of a cube and call that dimension three, and they say this exists. And, of course, that doesn't make a lot of sense because if you have a dot that doesn't exist, make a line that doesn't exist, make a plane that doesn't exist, you can't slap six of them together and get existence. All you get is non-existence to the fourth. Now this is a riddle that has been um, plaguing philosophers and, and mathematicians for, for eons. It goes back, you can find references to it in the ancient Chinese uh, philosophers trying to figure this out. And Nassim, not knowing that, decided he was going to figure this out and he was going to solve it before he got home that day. And uh, so he spent some time really pondering it. And, um, um, and, and what he realized is that, well, I won't go into his whole story, but what he realized is that everything is dots embedded within dots. And the idea that you can imagine is that if you look at your hand and you, and you zoom in on your hand, you imagine there's all these little cells, which are dots. And if you zoom in further, you'll see the atoms, which are dots. And if you zoom in further, you see the, the, the protons and the electrons and the subatomic particles, and it's just dots and dots and dots. And same if you zoom back out. If you, see, if you zoom far enough out, you'll see planet Earth as a dot. You zoom further out, and the, and the sun becomes a dot. You know, we see dots that we call stars. Those are massive objects, and yet to us, they look like dots. So the basic assumption that the dot doesn't exist was, was the mistake, that it's all dots embedded in scales. And he was so excited, he went home and he told his mom, and of course she thought he was nuts and, and uh, figured that he would get in trouble for, for uh, putting that on his, on his uh, test uh, answers. So anyhow, I'll let, you tell, I'll let Nassim tell you that story. Um, he, he, has lots of stories like that on the DVD that, you know, he gets, uh, he gets right into it. It's pretty funny. But uh, I do have one little um, uh, graphic of that concept of zooming in and out. the big island of Hawaii.
That's uh, similar to a, a little clip they have at the beginning of the movie Contact. Do you, do you remember that when they're, uh, when they're zooming in and out? And, and you know, you really start to understand that there's an awful lot of dots in this universe. And when you get to the right level of scale or the light, right level of resolution, they're not just dots. They, they're, they're real, you know. And like in Horton Hears a Who, a, people, uh, a person is a person no matter how small. So we can't discount the dots. It's, uh, it's really important. So um, just getting back to the, to the, to the uh, process as Nassim understood this, um, we, uh, what, what I'm going to do here is explain to you the, the fullness. Because if, if we've got dots and we've got fullness embedded into really small, and, and as you zoom out, you've got, you, you know, you keep going to higher levels of scale, what you start to realize is that space is full. It's not empty, and, and current science wants, uh, has, a, has a tendency to look at space as being empty. You know, they talk about the atom being 99.99999% empty space, and, you know, we think of the distance between ourselves and other stars as being, you know, empty space or vacuum, you, you know, the vacuum of space. And that's inaccurate, and this is one of the first big paradigm shifts that we're going to get into um, to, to really understand this theory. And uh, to use an example to understand that, we're going to start with a circle. And you can imagine this being um, a sphere in 3D. And the reason we start with this as the model is because the circle or the sphere is the largest volume that's possible in 3D space. And that's the expansive side of the equation. If you, know, if you have something expand, it wants to go into a sphere. And then we add a triangle. Or in 3D, it would be a tetrahedron, which is a three-dimensional triangle. And that represents the most contractive space that you can volume, that you can hold in 3D. Uh, if you were um, in the business of doing drinking boxes for kids, if you made your drinking boxes in the shape of a sphere, you'd have the most amount of juice with the least amount of packaging. And if you put your um, drinking boxes in the shape of a tetrahedron, you'd have the most amount of packaging with the least amount of juice. And that's the difference between the most expansive and contractive volumes that we can get in 3D. Now, in order to, uh, to keep the, the, our, our example con consistent, we'll add one more triangle. And the reason for that is because everything we see in nature has polarity. If we just kept one triangle, we could do this example with just one triangle. But if we, if we add the second triangle, we get a balance of polarity. With just the one, we got it sort of bottom heavy. And now it's nicely balanced. And of course, you see that we've got a, a very famous ancient symbol represented all over the planet. And um, we're going to be seeing more of that a little later. So, uh, so we'll, we'll use this as our model to, uh, to explain this idea that we can have infinity within a finite space. Now, when you create this, um, what you have is, is the the Star of David, if you will. There's lots of names for it, but we'll just work with that for now. And then you get little miniature triangles in each section. And as you add boundaries or circles, which you know go within the, the first circle we set for ourselves, you have miniature um, representations of the same model. And you can keep dividing like that within each little triangle and creating little miniature stars of David on each one and, you know, and just continuing to create boundaries around each one and dividing and dividing and dividing. And you could continue to divide that um, forever. You know, you could continue to make smaller and smaller and smaller stars of David. And the trick here, and this is where it becomes really compelling, is that no matter how many times you did this, you could set your computer to do this and continue to make more and more and more divisions until, you're, until the computer burned out forever and ever, you know. Um, but never, ever, ever, ever would you exceed the original boundary that you set for yourself. So what the original boundary is, is a finite boundary. And what you can divide to is infinity. And that's a way of realizing that within a finite space, you have infinity. And on a philosophical level, um, we understand that this is really significant. In, just take a moment right now and try and imagine infinity. 
and you and you get a you know you try and think of like the edge of the universe and beyond something like that a lot of people would do that but what a lot of people don't realize is that there's two infinities there's there's infinity out to the infinitely large and there's also infinity to the infinitely small infinity goes two directions and when you can only try and grasp the big part you get overwhelmed pretty quickly you know what can I do to affect infinity well not too much but when you realize <laughs> infinity also can be divided forever that makes you realize we have infinity within our own self within within any point there is infinity and the philosophical implications of that are huge you know masters that have walked the earth have said that the kingdom of heaven is within you know things like that that to that to reach your infinite nature go within you know this is what these masters have been telling us but this isn't just you know pithy advice this is actually a, a, a physiological truth um, I think that my opinion uh, I think that religion in general has done us a disservice or at least some religions um, they've tried to separate you from God they've tried to say we have God you come to our church and, and come see our priests and we'll you know we'll give you a, a little bit of a uh, spoon feeding on on God's you know we'll we'll sort of hook you up a little bit because we got the goods you know not that they would use those words but <laughs> but they've tried to separate you from God and make themselves the the liaison and and therefore get power out of that I, that's uh, you know as I say that's my opinion I think that science has not been much different they've created these isolated systems and they've separated us from each other. They've told us we're separate from each other. There's empty space between me and you. There's empty space between us and the stars. There's empty space in the atoms. And I don't think that's true either. When we, when we look at this from the other way, we see infinity. We see fullness of space. We see ultimate connection. And of course, this is what our masters have been trying to tell us. Um, the uh, the, the goal, the, uh, the science has tried to use these isolated systems in order to simplify things. And it's, it's been handy in, in a lot of ways to be able to isolate things so that they can study different phenomena by itself. But that gets you into trouble because the, the world is not isolated. And even in the textbooks, it says that there is no such thing as an isolated system. And uh, I'm just going to give you a quick little video that's really funny that kind of shows the, um, the kind of trouble you can get into when you're seeing things as, as an isolated system rather than zooming out a bit and seeing the big picture. And I warn you, this is a little bit weird, so. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that, that's a little twisted, but, I mean, you get the idea that it's probably, in general, a good policy to look at things uh, from a more holistic view. And, and, again, you know, we have a lot of examples in, uh, in philosophy and spirituality that suggest that that's probably the way to go, and, you know, I think we're at the point now that that's, uh, that that's what's happening. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the current paradigm of, of science that uh, suggests that we have an expanding universe. Um, does anybody remember this concept of the balloon and the pennies glued on top and, and it expands out as the balloon is blown up? Is, does anyone remember being taught that in, in school or hearing about that? Yeah. Um, because with, with our uh, modern technology, we're observing that the galaxies are moving away from each other. And so we figure the universe is expanding. And as a result, they had the, the Big Bang Theory on the theory that it all came out from the beginning of something, and it's expanding out. 
Well, uh, Nassim got himself into a little bit of trouble because he went to this physics conference and he uh, said, I've been looking in your books and I can't find the equation for who's this guy. <laughs> the, uh, one of the uh, fundamental laws of physics, of Newton's laws, is for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So here we have this fundamental truth or this fundamental theory about the expanding universe and yet there's no uh, explanation for this guy. And so Nassim draws in the, uh, the rest of the guy, and it's a good thing he's a scientist, because I'll tell you what, his artwork is pretty, pretty lacking. This is the guy's arm, and this is supposed to be his lungs. And, you know, we understand that if there is an equation, we would have the expanding universe on the one side and something contracting on the other side, that, that there's, a, that there's a, um, a feedback to that. If the universe ex is expanding, the lungs contract. Well, it's, he, again, he tells the, the story, he's pretty funny, uh, that uh, when he said this in this physics conference, the whole room went silent. You know, one guy spit his coffee out, and you know, they, people were sweating because they don't have a, an explanation for this. And that's a pretty simple, common sense question, you know. Now, one of the things that, uh, that they're doing with, uh, with physics is, um, I'm just going to mention this real quick because it, it ties into what we're going to talk about in a bit. Uh, the, there has been calculated in the density of the universe, the density of space, um, a vacuum density which is very, very high. And it's a, it's a really, really large number and as a result, it really kind of messes up their equations. And so in order for um, physics to be able to handle their equations, they created this thing called renormalization in, uh, in for quantum field theory. Present day quantum field theory gets rid by a renormalization process of an energy, energy density in the vacuum that would formally be infinite if not removed by this renormalization. And this is a number that was calculated and has been tested um, with the Kashmir experiments and, and a number of new experiments since then that has uh, figured out that the, um, that the amount of density that has to be removed for the rest of their calculations to be manageable um, is based on the Planck's distance. And what they did is they took the Planck's distance, which is this itty, 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 itty bitty distance. It's uh, basically considered the smallest thing the universe does. And if you want sort of a, a um, very simplistic idea, it's the wavelength of a photon. It's the, it's the distance that a wave of light goes to cross itself. And anything smaller than that, if you don't even have one wavelength of light, you can't see it, it doesn't exist, it's, it's, it's not in our awareness. So anything smaller than that, we can't perceive. And they took the Planck's distance and, and figured out how many of them they could stuff into one centimeter cube of space. The Planck's distance, by the way, is 1.616 times 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. It's really, really small. And they stuffed it into one centimeter cube of space. And they found that they could get 10 to the 94 grams per centimeter cube. Now, now, they, now they had this manageable number that they could deal with, which I think is pretty funny because if you imagine 10 to the 94, that's 10 with 93 zeros. Okay, in your bank account, if you have $1,000, you're feeling pretty good. If you add a zero to that and you've got $10,000, that's a pretty big jump. If you add another zero to that, the, the jumps become exponentially larger each time you add a zero. And just for fun, I decided to uh, write a check to the universe uh, for the amount of the vacuum density, just to see what that number would look like. <laughs> it's uh, one kajillion, bazillion, gazillion. I made that up. And uh, it starts like that. And you can sort of imagine how big that number is getting. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's, that's not what you'd call a finite number, in my opinion. That's, that's huge. Uh, just for a matter of reference, right here is where the uh, density of the entire known universe ends. We add another, uh, like, 50, no, 43 more zeros onto it. Or, is that right? Uh, yeah. But about 40 more zeros on after we get the entire universe. 
Now, they had to sort of sweep that under the rug because it was, it was really, th I'll put that out like that so you guys can visualize that for your law of attraction work. <laughs> Um, yeah, they had to add, or they had to, um, they had to kind of sweep that under the rug for their equations because it, it was making the equations unmanageable. So, so that's what they did, and um, and discovered there's there's the same uh, the universe in in a cube, ten to the fifty five, I think it is. Yeah. So. What we, what we, and, and what Nassim done, has done is that he's realized that space is full. He's not trying to push that under the rug. He's trying to incorporate it into his awareness of how space and time work. And uh, as he was on his journey and figuring out what his, uh, uh, what his awareness was trying to tell him, he was traveling in Mexico and went to Chichen Itza and, um, and also to, uh, and, and, and studied about the uh, pyramids at Teotihuacan as well, and um, realized that there's something going on. Now, we've all been told that the pyramids were built by Egyptians and Mexicans and people from pretty all kinds of different countries that just happened to collectively decide that they were all going to do the same kind of monuments and structures using log ropes, log uh, and, and vine ropes and, and copper tools, and of course, I'm not going to insult your intelligence to to uh, make you think that that's likely true. I mean, in engineering today, we haven't got the skill to, to create these monuments, so the chances of them being able to do it with um, primitive tools, I think, is... is I, I don't understand how that theory is still being perpetuated. But uh, anyhow, Nassim went um, and realized that there was something going on and decided to stud study it a bit further and found a book called The Mysteries of the Mexican Pyramids. And when he opened the book, uh, this is the, uh, the page that he randomly opened to, to, I think it was page 260, and uh, this graphic of a tetrahedron within a sphere was the first thing that he saw. And he was, uh, he was he's funny, he tells the story, he's, he was really kind of bummed out because when he realized that somebody else had already figured out this geometry, he, he, you know, he's like, I was going to, I was going to get copyrights on this, I was going to, you know, and, uh, and they beat me to it by 2,000 years, so. <laughs> and in this book, he realized that whoever had, uh, had written this book was, was definitely on the same track he was, so he researched a bit further. And one of the things they suggested was that uh, Buckminster Fuller was a, a major um, figure who had a strong awareness of this kind of geometry. And so Nassim um, can, proceeded to start studying Buckminster Fuller's work and discovered uh, the isotropic vector matrix um, that, uh, that Bucky had uh, been um, working with. And this, I'm just going to kind of blast through this fairly quickly because it, it gets a bit complicated, the process. But what you need to understand is that the geometry within this, Bucky believed was a fundamental geometry of space-time. Um, but what, what Nassim um, thought about is that there are negative spaces in in the uh, in the matrix, and that that he you know I'm not sure how he knew this and why you have to get into his brain a little bit more to figure that out. But um, but he understood that the negative spaces were significant and that they had a lack of of um, polar balance. And he really wanted things to be balanced. So he knew that there had to be more to it, and eventually came to the realization as we started with at the beginning, that there's going to be a balance, uh, a polarity that's balanced to this geometry. If, if this is the geometry of the structure of space, then there had to be a balance to it. So he, he made two vector, uh, isotropic vector matrices. And then he had a problem because it created an oval. And he knew that, that things in, in our observation tend to be in a, in a sphere, not an oval. So. He had a chicken and an egg problem, ha, 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 everybody, uh, he's told that joke so many times. And I, I'm kind of embarrassed that I'm telling it again, but it's kind of funny. Anyhow, a uh, chicken and an egg problem, and, and eventually came to the uh, understanding that if he squashed the two isotropic vector matrices together, not only did he get this balanced polarity, but he also gets the, um, 
the negative cavity space in the middle to fill up each of the cavities so, they, so it becomes full in the center. And this is significant because what you get in the center of that is um, yeah, the cube octahedron and with the vector equilibrium at the center. Now, that's significant because um, it's the most stable geometry that you can have in three dimensions. And I'll explain a bit about that. If you imagine a vector as a force, and we have the length of the line representing um, the amount of force that's pushing and the direction. If we have two equal lengths line pushing together, they're, they're an equal force, and there's a certain amount of equilibrium to that. However, if you push in a different direction, that won't stay stable because, because there's, there's, uh, it just lacks stability because it's, it's only one direction. And of course, in reality, we have more than just one direction. And so that's not stable. And then you'd think if you want to find something stable, you'd add vectors, again, of equal length and, um, and see what you get then. Now, at this point, you have a problem because the, the vectors going into the center are shorter than the vectors on the edge. And so the edge vectors would push in and you'd have an implosion. So you'd add some more vectors and you'd put them on a 45 degree angle and again with the equal sides. But when you complete that, you've got shorter vectors on the outside and longer in here and so it would explode. So that's not stable. The only way to get it to be stable and balanced is if you have this hexagon shape with the vectors going in. Now that's the representation of it in two dimensions and if you take um, six of those and uh, sort of line them up you know in 3D so that they're all evenly spaced you get a 3D vector equilibrium and actually the next slide shows it a little bit clearer how you've got like the yellow one is one plane and the purple one and then the blue one and then the red one each represent one of those 2Ds and you've got 12 vectors going into the center and that shape is the most stable geometry that you can have in 3D. If you take that shape and you had an elephant trying to squash on it, he couldn't break it no matter which direction you, you placed it on. It's equally stable from every different direction. It's the most stable geometry in 3D. And uh, as this um, information was, was being formulated at the same time, and this is where it gets real fun, is that the crop circles were showing up kind of at, on a similar uh, timeline as the discoveries that Nassim was making. And I mean, <coughs> that's, uh, that just blows my mind that, that you know, can, can you imagine like coming up with these discoveries and, and you know, understanding things and, and realizing that there are crop circles literally coming to, to kind of confirm what you're saying. Now this particular crop circle was predicted by um, a certain psychic, and I'm afraid I can't say who exactly it was, that they said that this was the most important crop circle uh, <coughs> ever to, to that date. And what we see, if we look at it a bit further, is that it represents in a 2D fashion the same geometry as the vector equilibrium and, the, and with the cube octahedron as, as the outside of it. You, you see that? So, uh, so that's kind of fun. So uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about crop circles today. If you uh, have the opportunity to come on Saturday, I highly recommend it because we've got all kinds of neat stuff about crop circles and, and uh, it, it goes pretty deep on, on that. But um, just to kind of give you a little bit of a, of a taste, um, there's a few crop circles here that we're going to refer to. In this, uh, in this example, we see the curved lines. And one of the things that is really significant is that what we're dealing with in life is a polarity. We've got these negative, or, or sorry, um, straight lines that, that I would say represent the masculine kind of contractive side of the equation. And then we also see curved lines, which I think represent the female or the expansive side of the equation. <coughs> and the crop circles are all showing both of those um, aspects because it's, it's never one or the other, it's both. This crop circle showed up, um, this was one of, the, one of the largest crop circles that was, was around to date. But again, you, ha you have to come on Saturday to get uh, a, f a full taste about that. 
And uh, some of the other crop circles I'm just going to show here just to, um, to show you that what we see in reference to spin. Because as I say, there's a, there's a feminine and a masculine. There's a contractive and a dynamic side to this equation. And here are some crop circles that, that remind us about the spin and the, and the circle. This, is, this one is uh, outside of Stonehenge. This, this crop circle, and so I think there are people here that know more about crop circles than I do. But uh, this one showed up in the middle of the afternoon. A plane flew in uh, with tourists to go see Stonehenge, and when they flew back, this crop circle had appeared while they were touring around Stonehenge for, for 20 minutes. So that's, <laughs> that's pretty fun. Um, and, and so just to get a little bit further into the concept of spin, because that's the, that's the other half of this, um, current physics, uh, one of the problems that, that, one of the reasons they've had a tough time is because they've created these isolated systems. And in, like for example, in Einstein's field equations, he attached the observer to the spinning object in order to be able to understand it more, more simply. And as a result, lost um, a major amount of the force involved in, uh, in the event. If you imagine um, like the shaft on a motor spinning, if you were to grab the shaft while it's spinning with your hands, you'd have heat, you'd have friction, you'd have flesh flying, you'd have, you know, you'd have some trouble there. And by attaching the observer to the spinning object, they've, they haven't accounted for that huge amount of energy. And when you observe in nature, you see spin everywhere. The planet is spinning, the, the solar system is spinning, the galaxy is spinning. That's a huge amount of energy that, that's not really being adequately um, uh, accounted for in science. And, and, you know, it's not surprising that as a result, they've got... 96% of the mass of the universe unaccounted for, and they, they call it dark energy or dark matter. Well, that's not necessary when you, when you have a ho more holistic understanding of space-time. You don't need to get rid of, uh, you don't have to renormalize and have dark energy and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's all accountable. And if you understand it, not only can you account for it, but you can potentially tap into it. And that's, that's what the crux of this information is about, is is our ability to understand the true nature of the vacuum structure so that we can start to tap into it and you know advance in our in our understanding of how to how to develop energy um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the spin um, as what Nassim has done and also with the help of Dr. Elizabeth Rosher which who is a, a, a very well um, uh, she's won many awards and so on as a, as a physicist. Um, they've solved Einstein's field equation by adding in torque and Coriolis forces, which are re referring to the spin, um, and, and solved Einstein's field equations using, using the, the concept of spin. And it works. It, it, <laughs> you, know, it, 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 you don't need to attach the observer. You need to see the whole picture. And uh, what they ended up coming up with is an understanding of the topology of how the spin works, and we see it represented all over the place, um, as, as a dual torus. And this, you know, this reminds me of that, that dream I was having about the donut-shaped universe, <laughs> you know? This is the idea that they came up with, and I have a, a graph, or a, um, uh, I have it in a, in a little um, movie here. Let's see, where's it going? Or spinning. And this is just going to toggle between the side view and the top view. Oh, maybe not. Now, I'm, I'm not uh, really, this graphic I think needs some work as far as the actual animation goes. But you get the idea that we have things spinning in towards the center, and we have things contracting at the equator. And we see examples of this in nature, where we see things being pulled in at the center and, and expanding. And this is such a beautiful model, the idea that things go in and come out, that there's a feedback, a continuous feedback. And in galaxies, we see the spiral arms coming out at the, at the equator of the dual torus. In, on planets, we see that the, it's, it's not quite as hourglass shape, but we have, 
you know, the, the, the expansive sphere-like, and we have the polarity at the top of our planets. And we see all kinds of examples of this in nature. And it, to me, represents what, I, what you could call the continuous creation model. You know, we don't have to get in a debate about the Big Bang or about intelligent design or anything. It's continuous. It's a feedback loop. And we see that in our, in our, um, in our lives. There's, we breathe in and we breathe out. We pull information in and we share what we've learned. We, we take in the world and we, and we share our truth of who we are. It's a continuous feedback loop. We're always giving of who we are, and whether that's good or bad, it, you know, it can be debated, but you're giving something out by being present in this world and you're also taking in. And we see that all over the place. And, and so this is, a, this is a topology, a model of reality that just rings true on a very deep level. And, uh, and there are examples of it that you can find in nature. Or like a lot. Um, nowadays with, with uh, you know, Hubble and all that kind of stuff, they're, fi they're finding all kinds of things that are um, confirming this as a, as a model. Um, well, th they say they don't understand some of the phenomenon, but the, uh, but the model, you know, Nassim, he, when, uh, you know, when they do reports about something that's been discovered, like the black holes at the center of galaxies, that's just recent discovery. When he, 20 years ago, he was making that prediction, he was getting kicked out of physics conferences. Well, now that's being confirmed. All, the, all galaxies, a black hole at the center. Well, how can there be a black hole? Because our understanding is that a black hole just sucks everything in. But what they're not realizing is that there's two sides to it. It sucks in and it radiates out. And that's why you get these galactic spiral arms and, and you know, we see the stars. They're moving out from the center, not coming in until they come back on the feedback loop. And we even have a picture of a galactic spiral um, that shows how it goes out and back out and around. So, um, so I'll just actually skip right to that slide and, and show you. This is a, a really rare picture because you can see the stars spiraling out and then you can see the whole event horizon, the whole boundary condition, and then sliding back in and then there's the black hole at the center. It's really stars, and that looks like a needle coming up the middle, or is that just? Uh, yeah, no, that's those are stars. This Holy is this shit. is. I mean, obviously the <laughs> the arrows are are painted yeah, in, yeah. but the rest of that is a, is a photograph. Wow. Yeah, and you can get it on the internet. I'm not. Do you know what the name of that graphic is? We got to find the name for that. Stars. You're sure that that <coughs> funnel that is at right angles to the spiral is a cone of stars. I believe it is. This is a photograph taken, I believe, with the, with the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's, uh, I, I apologize, I don't have the details on the exact name of this I, photograph, but it's... I don't think it is. Yes, actually, uh, that's being sucked into a vortex of energy. It's all coming yeah. being sucked in, so you're seeing a light, like you see it down there. And on the other side, that's what she's saying is exactly right. <laughs> well, and we see it represented in other um, other stellar dynamics with um, I think that <coughs> blazars vertical, and that vertical thing is not stars; it's some kind of plasma. Okay, that that may be true. It's something. It's something that they can photograph. Yeah. I, I doubt yeah, that they're subatomic because this is a galaxy. This, plasma, these are huge events. Plasma glows. Things fall into the black hole. They kind of get ground up divided down to the smallest levels of matter, which is like plasma, and okay. is ejected out right angles to the plane of the uh, spiral arm star galaxy. Right. Here's the, here's the reference, by the way, of the, of the Hubble um, photograph. I think that the black hole is at the top of the column, not the bottom of the column. Well, again, it's a continuous creation, so it's all but one I big mean, thing. The, yeah. the singularity would be at the center, but the, the process, the, it starts at the top, but it doesn't just start there. It's, it's the whole thing starting all at, the, at any point. You can put yourself on any point in the model and see that it's all happening continuously. Well, this is your transparent donut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, here's some examples of pulsars, and again, you get the, you know, sort of the, 
um, the, the emissions along the, the polarity as well as along the equator. So um, the last thing I want to talk about real quick before we go to break is uh, the latest and greatest thing that's uh, coming out of the Resonance Project right now um, is the Scaling Law paper. And uh, this is something that Nassim has presented in the past, but he has officially published it now um, as of about two or three weeks ago. It's also available on the uh, website, um, theresonanceproject.org. And uh, this, is, this is really exciting. This is the kind of stuff that is undeniable uh, logic that's holding water that's you know that's really getting some attention in the physics community and the scientific community and um, what what this all how this all started is that the um, uh, Nassim had the opportunity to meet Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher and uh, they met up and spent three days in a room together talking as he explained his theory and she, bless her heart, listened because he's, he's quite fringe and yet she sat and listened to him and listened to what he had to say and was quite skeptical, uh, but uh, gave him the benefit of the doubt and, and was curious about what he had to say. And when they were done, she said, you know, if what you're saying is true, if there is a structure that's in the fullness of the density of the vacuum, and there's a spin to everything, uh, then what we, would, what we would see in observation is that each of these events, these spinning things, um, would have a scale relationship. That we would be able to plot them on a, on a linear graph, like just, you know, the stuff you learned in second grade about, about plotting things on a graph. And we should be able to see that there are boundary conditions between all of the major events that we see in this universe. And so they got busy and they started writing the math. And sure enough, much to Dr. Rauscher's amazement, it actually works. And so what they've got here is they've got the radius of an object and the hertz, uh, which represents the energy or the, the frequency of the object. And starting with the universe, that's you know, quite large on the, on the, uh, uh, um, on the axis here on the x-axis, and it's got a very, very small frequency, 10 to the minus 17. The next one, uh, G2, that's a galactic um, point, and again, it, it's plotted and goes on the line. We've got G1 is, is the smaller size galaxy. Uh, the next one is a, a stellar or solar, like an average uh, star. Uh, the next one that makes this really remarkable is the atom. It's one of the only uh, graphs that I know of that can um, appropriately plot cosmological size objects and subatomic size objects on the same linear graph. This is, this is you know, as I say, the, <laughs> the goal of science since science began. Now, that in itself is remarkable, but the second part of this is where I just get really freaked out because it's so exciting. What they also discovered is that the distances between each of the events, between the boundaries that we see, is coming out to a phi ratio, the golden ratio. How, who's, is there anybody who's not really familiar with what a phi ratio is? Okay, good. Um, the phi ratio is something that we see represented in nature all over the place. It's, a, it's one of these fundamental numbers like pi. Uh, it's, a, it's a number that can't be perfectly calculated because it, it, the, the decimals just kind of go on forever. But it's an approximation that is, is always, uh, nature is always trying to get to this approximation. And it's, a, it's, the, golden, it's the golden ratio. And it's, um, it's a magic number. At, at the Residence Project, we're calling it the Phi Religion now because it's, it's highly compelling. And uh, oh, there's, a, there's a little data point that Nassim doesn't mention in the physics conferences, but uh, you have to come on Saturday to find out more about that. That one's, uh, that one's amazing. Um, the phi ratio, oh, that's just an example of how our cellular structure goes through this exact geometry, too. Um, this, is, this is a Fibonacci 
sequence representing the phi ratio, the golden, the golden mean. Um, phi is represented in your own body. The, the distances between the first part of your finger and the second part is a phi ratio. And from this <coughs> first and second together to the third is a phi ratio. And that to that is a phi ratio. It's just, a, it's just how we're built. You know, it's a, there's a, a, a divine sort of beauty and a divine sort of um, balance to this ratio. And it's found all over the place. Um, in this case, we see that the pink and the blue line are a phi ratio. And then the, um, the blue line versus the green line is a phi ratio. The green line to the red line is a phi ratio. And this, um, this geometry is something that you see represented in organic nature. Uh, a lot of flowers, for example, you'll see have five petals. In crystal structures, we see a lot of um, tetrahedral geometry. And in nature, we see a lot of uh, pentagrams and, and um, five-pointed stars. This is a nautilus shell. This is a, um, a logarithmic spiral. And you, you, know, you kind of get the idea that there's a, a really significant and divine, um, um, what's the word, balance to it. And I have a little um, graphic here as well showing the phi ratio. And you can just imagine, you know, you get on this staircase and you just keep going and going and going forever. From infinitely large, if you go the other way, down to infinitely small, and it, it just never stops. Okay. We're almost ready for break, but I just want to show you a couple more slides here. Um, there's, <laughs> there's some more, uh, more phi. Is that broccoli? It's, uh, it's called a uh, Brassica romanesca. It's, it's kind of a hybrid. I think it's a hybrid. I don't think. I'm not sure if that's a native plant. Um, and here's an example. This is uh, off, of, uh, off of Iceland. And this sort of gives you the awareness as well that you see spirals. You see logarithmic spirals. You see phi ratios all over in nature. And it's represented in the geometry of Nassim's uh, structure. So. That's, that's, again, part of how we know that it resonates deeply and there's, there's real uh, validity to it. Okay. Now, I'm going uh, to take a break here, uh, give you guys a break. Uh, try not to, to go too long because we've got a lot of neat stuff coming up. Derek's going to talk a little bit more about some of the examples where we find um, references to this geometry in ancient knowledge. And I'll tell you what, that goes... Oh, that goes far. It's, uh, it's a quest for the Holy Grail, 2008 style. It, it's, uh, it's really quite exciting. Um, what I like to talk about and what inspires me is ancient archaeology. And that's kind of how I actually got introduced to the Sims work just by wandering through this library here because it's such a cool resource. And uh, the video kind of fell off the shelf at me, as a lot of videos do here. And um, this is what got my head spinning and, and my body resonating was, uh, you know, my whole life I've seen all these things and been taught, you know, the standard version of Egyptology is that uh, slaves built the pyramids using logs and rope vines with copper tools in a period of 20 years. And uh, it just doesn't add up. It never added up to me. And, it, you know, we don't know how the pyramids were built for sure, but we do know certain things about the pyramids. And what we know is that uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza is composed of 2,300,000 stones. So that's a big number. And uh, you're thinking if you're going to build things, you're going to build them out of uh, stones that you can move really easily. And uh, the average size stone is, you know, 100 tons at the base. And the outer shell, we're only seeing the undershell. The outer shell actually covered the pyramids, and they used most of it and quarried it to build Egypt, uh, to build Cairo all around it. So what's left is what's not been quarried and actually very little, only around the base. And I think there's a picture here where you can kind of see some of these larger stones at the bottom. Um, 2,300,000 stones, 20 years. So just doing a little bit of math on that, uh, the, the pyramid has a 13-acre base. And if you take a picture of it from space, the center of it is exactly a quarter inch off center of the base. 
So that's pretty accurate for 2,300,000 stones. Is there anybody who builds houses here today? <laughs> okay, so you know, a quarter inch, 2,300,000, you divide it, get the accuracy on each stone, pretty amazing. But when you do the math on how long it would take to place each stone, um, just let's say they work 10 hours a day for 20 years, seven days a week. And the reason they say it took 20 years is just to make the dynastic history work. Um, so 10 hours a day, 20 years, you're placing a stone every two minutes. So that's like you're just hucking 100, 100 ton stones <laughs> up to that guy, and he's placing them perfect, you know, within 0.26 of an inch each one, even less, 2,300,000, you know, I can't even do the decimal on that. They were very large. So, very large people, maybe, yes. And that's possible. I'm not going to rule that out. I'm, that's good science, actually. Maybe they were very large people. But the current science is that it was done with copper tools that we hardened. You know, and so you ask, can, can we harden copper to grind stone to perfect, you know, you can't even fit credit cards between the stones, and they say, well, we can't do it, no. But the ancient Egyptians had a science to harden copper to that hardness. Um, I don't think so, but maybe. The other thing that's cool about the pyramids is when they first uh, tried to get into the pyramids, it was sealed so tightly, built so perfect, they couldn't find any entrance, so they uh, dynamited their way in. And uh, they luckily found a shaft. They didn't. They had a guesswork. You know, they did a little work. They figured if there was going to be an entrance, it would be on this side. Blah blah blah. And so they dynamited their way in, and uh, they found an air shaft. They didn't actually find the actual entrance, and they followed the air shaft to the king's chamber, and then it would backtrack to the entrance, and then they dynamited the entrance. And eventually, they found the king's chamber and the sarcophagus, and uh, they they figured it was a tomb. I don't know why, but because maybe the sarcophagus was in it. But the sarcophagus, when they found it, was perfectly sealed. And it has this like super heavy, I don't know the exact weight of the lid, but it's tons. And uh, they had to like get in there and lift the lid off. It's all hermetically sealed. And they open it up, and it's empty. And they said, you know, tomb robbers yeah. took the body. <laughs> so you know, and then they resealed it. Uh, again, and then sealed the entrance back up tight because that's what robbers do. They like to respect, they're very respectful tomb robbers. So there's a lot of problems with the whole idea that, you know, the pyramids were built as a tomb for a guy that was never found. And something that a lot, you know, when they show you these things on Discovery Channel, they show you pyramids and then they show you mummies and you have this idea that there was mummies found inside of pyramids. And that's just plainly untrue. There's actually never been any mummies found inside of any of the Egyptian pyramids. Most of the mummies are buried of, in, the, in the Valley of the Kings. And uh, it's kind of interesting that the other thing is, is the Egyptians wrote hieroglyphs on everything. There's hieroglyphs all over that tell, them, you know, tell everybody how they went to the bathroom, how they made love. There's not a single hieroglyph on any of the pyramids. There's not a single hieroglyph inside any of the pyramids. So it leads to a question of if a guy built a tomb for himself this big and spent 20 years doing it, wouldn't he put a hieroglyph somewhere on it that said this is the tomb of certain certain person? And that just, there's no evidence of that. Um, so that, that begs the question of who built the pyramids and what you do get, they say who built the pyramids. Here's some of those stones, by the way, at the base that are left, and those are in excess of 100 tons. And by the way, today we have our best cranes, and those cranes lift about 200 tons. Some of the stones you can see on the outside, there's the blasted entrance. Um, and when they move 200 ton stones today, or they don't move stones, they move 200 ton shipping containers, they move it from point A to point B. They lift it here off a truck bed and they put it into a shipping container. We can't move these things across sand and we can't move 200 tons around the desert and that would be very difficult. We'd cut that up and move them smaller. Um, this is a graphic that is awesome. <laughs> That's, that's me, right? Um, why is it awesome? Well, it's the geometry we're talking about. It's the flower of life. If anyone's uh, familiar with the flower of life symbol, with uh, Drenbala Melchizedek has done a lot of work on that. And uh, what's awesome about this is that you won't find this picture in any textbook. Um, it took Nassim 10 years of research just to even find out anything about it. And this is gotten off a pillar at the Osirian, Osirian Temple in Abydos, Egypt. Um, and it's an amazing thing because it's actually like 10 feet off the ground on this pillar. And Abydos, Egypt is actually 50 feet lower than the rest of the surrounding area. And they figured the Egyptians dug down 50 feet to build this temple, which again doesn't make sense. But um, it's not carved into the rock. It's actually laser burnt into the rock. 
And it's done perfectly, and we don't even have the technology to laser burn that kind of geometry today. And it's, it's laser burnt like into the atom, so you could chip off the outer layer and you'd still find it at another layer inside of it. So someone somewhere was trying to give this geometry a timeless essence. And it's the Osirian temple, and that's where supposedly uh, Osiris was reincarnated and, and rebuilt after he was cut up. And maybe they used the technology of this geometry to do that or something, I'm not sure. But. But here you see the 64 tetrahedron grid that Nassim came up with. If you put spheres around the tetrahedrons, you get the flower of life in a 3D version. And that's it in a 2D version, what you find at the Abydos Temple. So pyramids, they're all over the world. Um, there's pyramids in China. There's all sorts of pyramids in Mexico, South America. And again, is it just uh, a coincidence that we have pyramids built by every major civilization and that a lot of them just happen to be at this 19.47 latitude um, on the planet. Here we have the Forbidden City in China and again we have an interesting thing. We have the Sphinx, a lion with a paw up and what's underneath its paw is, I don't know if you can see that closely, but it's a 3D version of a sphere with that flower of life pattern on it and this is called the Forbidden City because it supposedly holds all the secrets to the universe, and there's a better close-up of it. So we're getting these same geometries, and we're getting them all around the world, and I don't think it's a coincidence. Um, this is cool. This is a pyramid under the ocean in Japan off the coast of Okinawa, close to that 19.47 latitude, and I do have a video on this, and if I can figure out how to work the computer a little better. But it's underwater, and uh, What's cool about pyramids underwater is you can carbon date certain things. Like if you, if you try to carbon date the pyramids, you carbon date it and you end up getting the, the age of the stone. And so that doesn't work out very good for when it was built. But we'll watch this and then we'll uh, I'll talk more about it. been almost universally condemned by scholars as fantasy. But new underwater finds strongly suggest its remnants may have been discovered around the southernmost territories of Japan. Separating the vast Pacific Ocean from the East China Sea, these are the Ryukyu Islands, of which Okinawa is the best known. Okinawa means floating rope, a name that seems to describe the whole Ryukyu chain. Less famous is the smaller island of Yonaguni. Here, at a place called Iseki Point, divers examine the ancient ruins of a sunken civilization. Descending to 30 meters in the crystal clear waters, they fight treacherous currents capable of carrying a hapless diver out to sea. Braving the danger, they are astounded to come upon an immense ceremonial center. What powerful forces brought it to the bottom of the sea? How old is it? Who were the people who made it? How did they use it? What became of them? The two sides of the brain got their own, their own skull. The spears got their own skull size. Where was that one found? Do you know? All, all these, I think, are South America. <coughs> and this is an ancient Sumerian text. And as you can see here, we get kind of a size relation to maybe people and then the sun god. And the sun god looks quite a bit larger. And then here we have an interesting disk with kind of a, a sun symbol in it. And uh, we're going to get into what that kind of <coughs> technology is on Saturday more. We don't have a lot of time, but basically with the understanding of the geometry and the vacuum and the contractive nature of space comes a whole new set of physics which allows for a whole new type of technology that's based on contraction rather than expansion. And currently our physics that we use for you know, our highest science is filling up a canister with rocket fuel, putting some people on top of it and launching it. And that's explosion, and that's the technology we use every day to drive our cars and to do other things. Um, we're <coughs> thinking that the possible technology that might have been used to build the pyramids to, uh, you know, the whole ancient world could have been built on a technology that had more to do with the contractive side of the vacuum. And it wouldn't be necessarily as uh, hazardous to the environment. So this is what I was meaning by the Sphinx. Are you suggesting that the stones of the pyramid might have been <coughs> coalesced into 
Well, that I'm, I mean, I'm not going to, I don't, I don't know how, they could have coalesced it, they could have cut matter away maybe, or disintegrated something, I don't, I don't begin to know, but I would definitely speculate on some sort of control of gravity to move them there maybe, rather than growing them or coalescing them into form. Um, so here's the Sphinx, and the other thing that's cool about the Sphinx is uh, that the head has actually been modified, and they think it was originally a lion's head, but that the Egyptians did the add-on. Because if it came 10,000 years you know, prior to what we thought, then maybe the Egyptians found it, maybe it was cracked or something and they wanted it. But they supposedly added that on to uh, pay homage to the pharaoh. And these are some of these sten the stones that are 200 tons that um, they quarried and stacked them on top of each other. And this is the erosion lines that I was talking about as well. And if you're looking at these small stones, these are actually repairs that have been done to it. So it's not actually built, but they have repaired the Sphinx in recent years to try to keep it together because it is eroding <coughs> still from wind, actually. And again, here we have you know 200 ton, 100 ton stones just being stacked like building blocks really easily, it looks like. And uh, this is the Osirian temple where that laser burnt thing was, and it's 50 feet below the surface. And so historians now are saying, okay, you know, they dug down to build it. But when you do the math on it, actually that amount of sediment that it would take to get up to where the rest of, uh, of the, the Giza plateau is, is about 10,000 years. So the math kind of adds up that the Osirian temple might have been there at the same time as the Sphinx was and the same time as that pyramid went underwater on the other side of the planet all about 10,000 years ago. And that's the uh, flower of life up high on that pillar. And the Sim actually had to go to find this picture. He couldn't find it in any textbooks. He couldn't find any mention of it. And I think it's because they can't explain it largely. But he had to actually send someone there to get the picture. And they don't really let people into this area because it gets flooded out underneath because it's so low. So I think he had to like bribe someone and get someone to let him in and get the picture. But there's more than one, as you can see. There's a couple of them, and they're burned next to each other. I think there's a third one even <coughs> below that. How, how big are those? Um, from what I've seen, I think they're a little bit bigger than a person's head. But you can see, they're all up here. They sort of fractal themselves, I see them all over there now. <laughs> Looks like they're arranged like a necklace. Yeah, it's an interesting pattern. So this guy, this guy is the most baffling thing. Um, <coughs> He is a thousand tons. A thousand tons of one solid granite block polished perfectly with copper tools um, on the surface and carved. And uh, they found him lying down like that. And so when they did, they were like, you know, we want to uh, go ahead and stand him up because we're going to build a museum to him. This is Ramses. Uh, Ramses the third. And so the company they called to do that was like, okay, we'll just have to cut him up into small pieces to do that and they were like what do you mean you know we want to make this museum so they decided to just leave him lying down because there was no way to move a thousand tons with our technology and where is that um that's in cairo they built the museum around him they built the museum around him because there was no way to keep him intact to, to use it but i mean a thousand tons is just a it's it's insane amount of weight to contemplate even so this is kind of a hard picture to show you um, up against another one, but there are other types of temples that are Islamic temples that kind of look like pyramids. And I don't know if you can make this out very well, but you can kind of see a structure there. And this is an Apollo moon surface image. That's kind of weird to see that showing up in a moon image. It, I, it kind of blew my mind, and I don't know enough about it to really go further, but Nassim throws it into his. 
But it's interesting to think that there could be structures that are like pyramids on the moon. We know that in recent times we've had some Mars images. That's a little bit clearer. So this is the Sidonia city on Mars where you get the, the face and then the pyramid structure near it. And there's been a lot of work uh, done on the geometry of this, and it has a very similar geometry of phi ratios and spirals and things turning up. So the odds of it being coincidental or natural, I mean, it could be naturally occurring, but it does naturally occur in phi ratios, and it has a real similar layout to the pyramids in Giza. So some of the stuff we're going to get into on Saturday, too, is some, some of the stuff about the Bible. And uh, when you get into the translation of the name of God in Hebrew, uh, you get Yahweh. And Yahweh, when you even translate that further, comes out to mean tetragrammatron. And when the Sim saw that, it really blew his mind because he got really happy that uh, you know God might be some geometry or something. Um, and so a four-sided geometry, like a tetrahedron, and the reason they call it tetragrammaton is four letters. You can uh, do the uh, translation meaning tetra four and grammaton maybe being like grammar, the root word, so four letters. But also because you can make this uh, cool shape out of it and get the, the name going in all these directions. But it adds up to 72, <coughs> which is like the 72 names of God. And you get the isotropic vector matrix and the name, the letters being on points. And then we also get into some cool stuff with the uh, Kabbalistic stuff, the Tree of Life, and how you can use the Tree of Life to construct that grid. If we have time for all this, but I'm just going to blast through a couple of these and you can kind of see it forming. And then again, you get the crop circle. When you do the math right, you always get a crop circle, it seems. <laughs> and this is Mecca, and it's just an interesting thing because if this was a, an animation or a video, all these people make the pilgrim to Mecca, uh, which is the holiest city in Islam, and they once in your life you're supposed to get to Mecca and bring your prayers, and then you come to the city, and in the center of the city is this box and then you circle around it seven times with your prayers and so if you're looking at this from above you're seeing like millions of people like spiraling around and it looks just like a galaxy and it's you know coming back to this idea of spin and and who knows what was in the box in the old days and why they went there but it's pretty amazing to see that many people spinning in these dynamics totally meteorite yeah, they call it the black sun, or the black stone. And that gets into, again, uh, the Sumerians supposedly had the black sun or the black stone. And we're going to get into the possibilities of what that might be and the technology that might be in that and what maybe the Ark of the Covenant was and all these other uh, ancient references to what I like to think of as might have been an ancient technology. And here's uh, some pictures of the Ark of the Covenant. And then the, the Bible, the Ark of the Covenant, one of the things that got in the Sims' attention about it was that it's described as having, this is the tabernacle where Moses had to keep the Ark, and it's described as having these pillars of fire by night and pillars of smoke by day. And uh, that got his attention because of the pillars of these vortexes, these vortices coming out of the top of the, the pillar. And instantly he knows that, you know, now we're talking about these same physics, <coughs> these same dynamics that we've been talking about in galaxies and tornadoes and uh, hurricanes. And so whatever this, uh, the arc was doing, it was mimicking galactic forces. And that's all I got right now, so. <laughs> I'd like to we got question and answers right now, so I'll take this guy's question. Steve. I'd like to know what point you're trying to make in showing this. Okay. Um, we don't have a lot of time. We didn't have a lot of time tonight to go into the whole holistic thing of it. 
But the uh, point I'm trying to make with the ancient archaeology and the ancient stuff with the Bible is that maybe in history there's been uh, races of people that have understood this, these same physics that we're trying to get with Nassim's theory here and that they've applied them and that it's not something that uh, is so far out there to think that we might be able to do something, some of the things they did and maybe even greater in the application of those physics. So when I show the pictures of ancient technology or the pyramids being built, I'm basically alluding to the fact that using these physics and possible inventions of these physics, you might be able to build pyramids or have control of gravity or things like that. So does that answer your question? <coughs> Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and take it a bit further uh, in regards to the Ark of the Covenant. Um, I'm not sure how much Nassim actually comes right out and says it, but I'm going to come out and say it and, and uh, as, a, as a belief that I have and an opinion, and you can take it for what you will. Uh, I believe that the ancients had advanced technology. I believe that the Ark of the Covenant was a representation of this understanding. The miracles in the Bible, Moses... Um, clearly had some sort of uh, gravitational effects going on, parting the Red Sea and the walls of Jericho and, and uh, you know, so these kind of things, which if you're told to take it on faith, you think, well, that's an interesting story and how can that be real? But if you have advanced technology on the scene, um, it's, it takes on a, a little bit of a different light and we can apply our sort of modern common sense that maybe they did part the Red Sea and the River Jordan and this sort of thing with advanced technology. And uh, that's what we're suggesting here is that the Ark of the Covenant was um, an advanced technology and not just uh, something that Moses talked to God with. So uh, I'll just leave that one with you and you got to come out on Saturday to hear a bit more about that. What time is Saturday? Uh, 10 a.m. to 6. 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Yeah, it's an all day, you know, normally to do this in two hours is like, we don't even mention the ancient archaeology because it begs that question. It's like, we're just going to slap that on and make it seem, it doesn't quite have a cohesiveness to it, but we wanted to throw it in to try to entice people to come out and learn more about it. And uh, when we have the time to really get into each level of it and piece this together, it comes out a lot clearer. So I do appreciate the question. I can understand why you'd be baffled. Um, I, I have one other question. Sure. Yeah, I don't necessarily need an answer. Okay. <clears throat> what makes you think that you don't or we don't have that same thing ourselves? Inside of us or like you mean as a society? Both. Well, that's, that's why I asked the question. I think we do, absolutely. I think according to Nassim's theory and my own feelings, um, inside of us is the same dynamics that would drive a galaxy. We have that same central singularity, infinity at our core. And we could also take that same idea and those same principles and build something like a computer that <coughs> uses those same principles externally as a society and manipulate those forces even beyond what I as a person might be capable of. You know, science has proven now pretty much that one person's energy is a unit of one, two people, on the same frequency have a energy quotient of six. So you that's 40 the... people, and you have the energy of either 200 or of 2,400, whichever way you want to go. So the exponential growth is happening there energetically. And it kind of goes to that Bible saying where two or more people meet in my name, uh, miracles will be done, I think that kind of... So if you do want to move something, if you have more people concentrating on the same frequency, it can be done. That's awesome. Can we do it? Guess what? The other one. <laughs> can we do that? <laughs> well, of course, it's done every day. I like have a lifting, friend in, 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 in Missouri that when he goes into meditation, he floats. At the end of the hour, his wife goes into his meditation room and repositions him over his cushion. That's cool. <laughs> wow. A lot of my friends are going to heavy meditation. That's one of the goals. Just to, to be able to fly or levitate. levitate. Well, I, I mean, again, uh, the dynamics inside of us and all these masters throughout time have supposedly manipulated gravity or levitated or walked on water. So I totally agree that controlling gravity is a possibility in, within the consciousness of a human 
in and of themselves. And two or more people or three or more people, you get miraculous healings happening. You get all sorts of effects when two or more people get together. We're going to have a little demonstration of that here tonight. Yes. <clears throat> because when we're done, these chairs need to go stack. There you go. The miracle <laughs> will happen when we get two or more people using the power. Go ahead. Does Ms. Sim contemplate um, the, the notion that reality is a construct of mind and there actually is no matter in his work? Uh, I think that, I, I'm just guessing because I can't answer for him, but I think that he would agree that it's a conscious event and that the feedback is a conscious um, development and that that's how the evolution and the continuous uh, evolution of understanding is happening is through this dynamic and we're, as, as things go through that dynamic they, they evolve and grow. Um, Dr. Michael Heisen is one of the authors of the scaling paper and I asked him the other day, I said, what's the difference between thought and matter? And he looked at me and he said, absolutely nothing. I think that um, matter um, is a more cohesive, more stable representation of the spin if you imagine uh, a, a, a pool of water or a river, and you have a little eddy of water, a little, a little soliton, a little spin of water, and it sort of shows up and then spins itself out and disappears again. That's something that you could think of as a thought. It just sort of appears and then, and then disappears again. Whereas um, in some rivers, you'll see standing eddies that, that continue to spin just because of the way the logarithmic spiral of the water flowing goes. And it holds a pattern. Um, I think that if you extend that, when you get um, a spin that, that holds itself, it eventually starts to create matter and, and create a, an actual event in space-time that is stable and has structure to it. But the dynamics required are the exact same. It's just one is more, co more coherent and stable and one is more fleeting. It's the same thing. So yeah, it's all, it's all energy, it's all consciousness just being held in different levels of complexity. Any other questions? Well, just as a spiritual generalization, I just wanted to bring up Buddhism because it's one of the most ancient philosophical <coughs> points of view. And they say, you know, mind is just what you said it is, and it's energy. And mind goes on beyond death. And yogis and yoginis who travel in space and fly, it's all there in Buddhism. I'm not, I'm, so I just wanted to put that out. I love, I love that thought, and I've, I've been meditating and thinking about that a lot myself, and I came to a realization the other day that was really exciting to me. Um, if, you, if you think of this dynamic with things spinning into the center of that torus or that donut and then radiating out, um, when we draw things into our field, the law of attraction, when we pull things into our little reality, uh, I believe we're responsible for what we bring into our reality. I've been living that philosophy for many years and it's been serving me all right. Um, we, we start bringing things into our own personal spin and as they come into our singularity, uh, they are transformed as they go out. One of the uh, great sayings of Buddhism is that the cause of all suffering is resistance to what is. And the big epiphany I had is that when something's coming into your reality and it's, and it's caught in that the pull of that black hole or the pull of that uh, vacuum density fluctuation, if you will. Um, once it's coming into your reality, if you try and resist that, if you try and stop it and say, no, no, I'm not allowing that in, I mean, gosh, we get all kinds of friction, we get all kinds of suffering, we get all kinds of trouble. And the lesson here is that once you've got something in your field, if you allow it, if you surrender it, if you allow it to pass through without resisting it, it comes out transformed, and it, it teaches you whatever you need it to learn, and it's a much more um, enlightening and pleasant experience if you don't try and resist it, because just by the physics of it, once it's in that spin, your ability to stop it is significantly diminished, and, and in my opinion, you, you can't stop it. So um, at that point, you have to start making choices about what you're gonna attract, and what you're going to choose to bring into your, to magnetize into your reality. I think there's a great philosophical understanding to be gained from this, from this topology. And it, and also the topology kind of demonstrates what consciousness is as, um, just as a process, as the universe turning back on itself 
and looking, and with the addition of new information, it, it changes, like she was saying. And that change is learning. We call it learning, or we call it evolving, or we call it growing, or we call it expanding. Remembering. Um, so it's, it's a fascinating look at like what even is consciousness, and <coughs> consciousness is a function of the vacuum, you know, with these geometries spinning and then creating these toroidal forces and feeding back on itself, and that's reflection. It's really, it's really amazing how this principle can work with all these ancient beliefs and religions and other things. Uh, could you say just a bit about the crop circles that you'll be talking about more on Saturday? Like, what? how does that <laughs> hang together with this work? You want to uh, well, a lot of it um, ties into just the, the, the um, chronology. As he was discovering these things in his own mind, he was being given these crop circles kind of, uh, by way of confirmation. Now, you know, that, that's uh, definitely open to interpretation, to interpretation as to whether he actually was being uh, directly... Uh, um, what's the word? Like he was uh, kind of being given some some extra feedback and some extra um, uh, help what, to encourage his process. So we'll talk about some of those. Uh, the other ones that we'll talk about are uh, the um, response to the SETI uh, message that was sent out that Carl Sagan sent out in 1972 um, with the Arezibo message that was um, you know just sent out. Hopefully our grandchildren or great-great-great-grandchildren might get a response back. Well, there was a crop circle that showed up that was in the same pattern as the Arezibo message and um, has a response from, and a very compelling response. There's also a crop circle of an alien and he burned a CD for us and it has a message on it in, in binary code. So um, so there's a lot of interesting crop circles. We're not, we're not crop circle. Um, aficionados. I, I think there's some people here in Ashland that know more about crop circles than we do, but um, just because it ties into this work, this is a very broad ranging work, so I, I consider myself kind of a jack of all trades because I know a little bit about a lot of subjects, but I'm not a master at any, any one of them, uh, just because there's not time enough in the day to learn all, you know, deeply all of these different subjects. So we're going to touch on some of those. And of course, what we're also going to see is a lot of representations of this geometry in the crops. This is this is in all kinds of the crop circles talk about this this geometry. Yeah. So we're just about getting up on nine o'clock. Is there any uh, any other questions you're dying to ask before we get going? <clears throat> yes. If uh, you might be suggesting the theory or belief that, for instance. Uh, the organic life on Earth, of which crops and nature is a part of, <clears throat> is a manifestation of some intelligence and is communicating in some manner or another, then human beings are an integral part of that. And what is happening with people is that we are here and exist because we are an expression of that communication. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. Um, when I, I want to get t-shirts made that say the Big Bang is still banging. We are the threshold of consciousness. Every time you create something new or have a new thought, that's literally the edge of the Big Bang still manifesting Eight out and, yeah. and producing new ideas, thoughts, and, and creations that have yet to be created. We are, the, we are the threshold of the event horizon in action. And, uh, and we represent consciousness in form. It's a most elegant concept. So you could say it's a fractalized geometric cosmic donut in a simpler way. Sure, yeah, it's all fractals, that's for sure. And, and we'll talk more about that on Saturday as well. I hope you can come out on Saturday if you can't you know, please uh, please let anybody know that you know in the area that would like to come. It's absolute good fun, and uh, I'll tell you what, it'll give you things to think about for an awful long time. The uh, the uh, entertainment value per dollar is, <coughs> will will take you far. I'm just Where is curious. This? It's, 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 it's here, here. At, from that ten till four, be, same room. I'm just curious if you touch on the same DNA genetic structure with your. Absolutely. Um, on Saturday, again, we're going to have more time for that, and that gets into the biology. Um, DNA has a 64 codon 
matrix to it, and that gets right into our 64 tetrahedron grid. It's not a coincidence. And then when we were talking, she showed a couple slides of the cells and how our body goes through these geometries even to develop. Um, it's pretty cool, and it definitely, uh, it definitely is part of it. So, yeah. Um, other than that, I think you know. I just want to say thank you for everybody for coming out and supporting us, and it's awesome uh, that Ashland's, Ashland's been like a hub for this. There's, there was uh, another emissary who works here. Um, he's off at a, the Solar Living Institute named Nathan Gustus, who uh, also lives in Ashland. So there's a lot of uh, energy. We have Asha, who is here too, who's friends with Nassim. So Ashland's got a big group of uh, concentration along these physics, and it's on the west coast of America has probably got more people into this than any other city. So that's really cool of this community and largely because of this library. So I want to say thank you for that. And thank you all. Thanks for coming. RVML Resource Center is a volunteer operated federal 501c3 tax exempt nonprofit organization. RVML is dedicated to providing easy access to a comprehensive collection of information on a variety of metaphysical, spiritual, and personal development subjects. RVML accepts and appreciates all donations. Material and monetary contributions are fully tax deductible. This recording is not copyrighted and permission is granted to broadcast, exhibit, or duplicate all or part of this program for non-commercial educational purposes. This live presentation was organized and presented by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. For more information, please visit rvml.org.